All right, I realize I probably need to shout for this one, so just let me know if you can't hear me. All right, so today I'm gonna chat a bit about Starling Bank, talking about how we built a bank from scratch, and I'll overview this from both the people side and technology side, and some of the infrastructure we've put in place to enable us to scale quickly. To start, how many of you have heard of Starling Bank, by a show of hands? Okay, so mo most of you. So we were started back in 2014 by Ann Bowden, who has a long career in banking. And basically what we had seen was that banks had been reasonably good at keeping up with technological change until 2008. And then there was the financial crisis. And then all of a sudden, new rules and regulations were being imposed and fines being levied. And innovation just dropped to the bottom of the priority list for banks. And yet, at that same time, some of the most transformative pieces of innovation were coming to market. So that was the year the iPhone launched. And then these really incredible apps like Uber and WhatsApp and Airbnb. So this gap started to emerge between what the banks were offering and what consumers were starting to expect, particularly in terms of the user experience. How intuitive and real-time and personalized apps could be. Hopefully you can hear me a bit better. Um, and so that's why Starling was started. We wanted to bring into financial services uh, the types of experiences you would see from a consumer technology company and start to fill that gap. So we took a few different elements that we really want to differentiate on in this space when we started out. The first thing was that we wanted to build the bank from scratch. Now, a lot of our competitors in this space actually saw the back-end technology as a commodity. So they would build on top of someone else's infrastructure, so like Wirecard or Bancor. For us, we saw this as pivotal to differentiating in this space. So if we came up with an amazing new algorithm for detecting fraud, we could turn to our team of engineers and build that out in a matter of weeks rather than the months or years that it could take if you were reliant on someone else's infrastructure. Further, one of the most important things we probably did was around the processes for the bank. So we don't have an IT department. Every team of the bank is cross-functional. And so having that structure from the beginning was really important for us. The second thing that we wanted to differentiate on was having a full banking license. So in order to properly compete with banks, we didn't want to be an e-money license. We didn't want to be a prepaid card. We wanted the same type of access and the same abilities as a fully licensed bank. Only with that can you give your customers FSCS protection, secure customer deposits, can you plug directly into payment schemes, and could we build out the platform in the way that we wanted to? So we took about two years to get that, and I'll overview the timeline in a moment. The next things that we really focused on was the user experience. So when you would talk to a product manager at a large bank at the time, they'd probably talk to you about interest rates. And while that was interesting, if you talk to a product manager at a consumer technology company, they would talk to you about things like your customer's pain points and how you solve those in delightful ways. For us, it was how long does it take to open a bank account? So rather than having to go into a branch location, bring lots of documents, we made it so that you could open an account in less than three minutes from your phone and then immediately be able to provision a card to Apple Pay or Google Pay and start spending within five minutes. So having that type of real-time instant experience. But then we started to go beyond that with a number of different features, particularly in terms of our open APIs and our platforms. I'll spend a bit of time talking about that at the end. So this was our timeline. So we actually kicked off with the regulators in June 2014. We actually didn't write the first line of code until about November 2015. Um, in order to get the full banking license, there's something called option B here in the UK, which has reduced the capital requirements in order to get the banking license. However, you still have to have enough capital to allocate for customer deposits in order to receive the FSCS protection. And so we raised 70 million in our first round of funding, which was back in the very beginning of 2016. We got our banking license with restrictions by June, which is what enabled us to start testing. So when you first receive your banking license here in the UK, you actually have a maximum of 50,000 pounds in deposits that you can hold while you're going through testing. So that's when we had our first MasterCard debit card, when we plugged into faster payments. We started really testing out the infrastructure. We made a decision which has become um, quite different in this as well, is to also build some of the core backend technology, including the general ledger. A lot of others in the space will use something like Mambu or Thought Machine. We decided against that, particularly because we're a single product company. We don't have mortgages and savings and other things. It's literally just money in and money out. And so we decided to build that out in the same process as well. So we launched in April 2017 with our full set of open APIs, which actually launched just before um, our full product in May 2017. 
We took a very different tact from most banks at this time in that we built out a full set of open APIs and locked up with the current product. So PSD2, if you're familiar, had already been announced at this time, but it was actually pre-open banking that we started building these. And this was with the idea that APIs had been fundamentally changing the way that software had been created and brought to market in consumer technology, but that type of innovation hadn't yet been brought into banking. So we built out the full set of open APIs and actually launched that in 2017. For those of you who aren't familiar, this is what the app looks like. So in the middle is the screen where you're getting a real-time view of your transactions as you spend each day. The next thing we really want to do was start to bring to life that vision of helping customers understand where their money is going and how do we help customers to have insight into their own financial data to make better financial decisions. So as customers spend on their Starling card, they get an instant notification rather than that two to three day lag that you usually have with most banks. Then we automatically categorize those transactions into eating out, shopping, and so forth. That's interesting, but actually what it ladders up to later is possibly more compelling. Because then as we're automatically categorizing these transactions, we can make it ladder up to an FCA compliant affordability assessment. So then when they need a line of credit, such as a credit card, mortgage, or loan, they don't have to fill out rooms of paperwork. They can just automatically be pre-approved. On the fourth, or uh, sorry, not the fourth screen, the last screen over there on the far left, it's called card control. At the time, this was rather innovative that you could go into the app and lock the card if you lose it. Um, it's now quite common, so a number of others have this as well. To the right of the pulse is the transaction screen. So as you spend on the Starling card, you get this real-time transaction. We integrated with the Google Maps API, so you can see that in the background. So you have the, the location data as well. And then on the last screen is the savings goals. The savings goals are not actually a savings product. They just pay the normal 0.5% interest that we pay on all deposits. It's just a way to parse out money in this. As we were expanding the product, we were looking at how do we continue to use technology to do things exceptionally well. So we do things like integrate with Google Nearby, such that when you open a joint account, you can do that within a couple of taps. Similarly, using technology like that for payments and making that easy and seamless as well. Um, I'll kind of breeze through this, but this is basically what it looks like as well, including with the transactions that you see there. So we also launched Starling for Business. So where this came from actually is when we first launched the retail current account, feedback that we got from a lot of customers is that sole traders actually wanted to use our retail account for business. And the reason for that is they felt disenfranchised by the large banks, being that they weren't offering them much more functionality that they needed, but often paying hefty fees for the service. And so it was quite easy for us to extend to provide sole trader accounts and then expanding that into SME now. So most provocatively, when we were building the bank, we built it as a bank with APIs. So on the one hand, this is the full set of open APIs that others can integrate into their products. The kind of use case for this is that APIs are a plug and cable between two different technology companies. It enables innovation outside the bank that you couldn't have thought of. For example, when Uber launched, it was actually built on Google Maps API. They didn't build out that mapping technology. It enabled them to get to market faster and at lower cost by using that functionality. The beautiful thing about APIs is it enables that in financial services. So it means a community of developers can all of a sudden innovate on this data that was previously inaccessible and build out things that we possibly hadn't thought of. But we wanted to take that a step further. So when the Competition and Markets Authority did their year-long analysis of the industry, they found that banks were incentivized to compete on either the price or the product experience. They found that about 2% of customers switched their bank accounts. And the reason for that is, one, the fees were often complex, so they didn't know what they were paying. And two, it was hard to switch. So no one really knew what would be better for them, and it would be difficult to switch even if they found something better. So they put in a few pieces of legislation to tackle this. So on the one hand, there's something called the Current Account Switch Service, which you're probably familiar with, where in Starling, you could put in your account number and sort code of your other bank. We would automatically move over all of your funds, all of your direct debits, automatically cl close your old account, and it's guaranteed to be done within seven days. But they also mandated open APIs. And the reason for that is to increase innovation and competition in financial services. What it means is that banks might be sitting on a gold mine of data, but they don't actually own that data. Customers own their own data, and it's up to the banks to help them share that securely should they choose to do so. It's supposed to create a level playing field with these other fintechs. It was also seen that, particularly in the UK, where we're, the, we're still the fintech capital of the world, there's lots of new financial technology companies that are being started up. They typically focus on doing one thing, doing it really well. They typically use technology, so cloud hosting and mobile, and so they have a much lower cost basis. So they have much lower cost for customers as well. So for us, rather than trying to compete with all of these different products, we decided to instead strategically integrate them in via API. 
So what this looks like in practice. If you were to think of a marketplace traditionally, you'd probably think of somewhere like Borough Market, a place where you'd go and lots of vendors are selling a variety of goods. Now, customers typically like to go to these places because they know that they have great choice. Vendors like selling their products there because they know that realistically lots of customers typically come to buy goods from this place. But this type of model, this market where lots of different people are selling goods, previously wasn't possible in banking or technology up until about a decade ago. The advent of APIs means that companies no longer have to be very heavy and vertically integrated with one company performing lots of different functions, but they can bring this type of experience into their product. So this is an example of a typical banking site. So you'd see banking and loans and credit, insurance, wealth management, all these services, the, the full horizontal feature set of retail banking services that one company often provides. This is an example, this is a, a slide that I did not create. It's been shared all over the world. It's called the platformification of banking slide or the unbundling of banking. And what it's showing is all of the fintechs who are now competing on each of these different services. So similarly with Starling, we're, we're nearly 100% cloud-based. We have a bit of physical kit for Swift, but mostly cloud-based and mobile only. It means that our costs are a lot lower. Similarly for these tech companies, their costs are a lot lower, so the fees for customers are also a lot lower. And they usually spend a lot of time focusing on the user experience and making that really exceptional. So for us, rather than trying to compete with all of these fintechs and all of the traditional institutions, we decided instead to strategically integrate them in by API. So this is what that looks like in the app. So what we've done is on the one hand, we've created a technology layer where we have set specific API requirements. We can send this out to anyone in the industry and without doing any bespoke work, we can add partners into Starling. What happens is if you go into any particular product category, you find a product that you want, when you click add, you're actually taken out of Starling and into the partner's flow. The reason for this is to actually get to the goal of giving customers meaningful choice and options. You can't just deeply integrate one product. It's all about giving customers choice. But in order to give customers choice, that means that you have to structure it from a technology perspective such that you don't have to do any work to add in additional partners. So whenever you click add, you're actually taken into the partner's flow. Now, when we were doing research on this, what we found is that typically, when you look at the conversion funnel for customers accessing products, the more steps you have to sign up, the more customers drop out of the flow. And typically, whenever you're signing up for financial products, you have to enter in the same information over and over again. So your name, your address, your date of birth, your account number, your sort code. So we enable our customers to immediately grant us access via an OAuth flow to share that data with the partner. If they say yes, then we automatically auto-populate the sign-up flow for that partner. Then they go about setting up, for example, an ISA or mortgage or whatever it might be in that partner's flow as they normally would. If the customer then says to the partner that they're happy for that data to be shared back into Starling, you see what's on the far right-hand side. And this is just high-level data per each partner. That way the customer has a sort of control center or hub of their entire financial life in one place. They can see their travel insurance, their ISA balance, their mortgage balance, everything all from within one view and can easily navigate from Starling into that partner. Now the interesting thing about this is that there's a few benefits that Starling gets from having this type of a model where we have the ability to get to market faster and a lower cost with a larger set of offerings for our customers. We have the ability rather than just upselling them the one product we offer to give them choice of various products from across the market um, and to also simultaneously create new customer acquisition channels. But the more interesting thing whenever we built this out was that we found a number of additional use cases for the platform APIs than we'd originally predicted. On the one hand, there was a lot of B2B application that we hadn't foreseen to start with. So for example, when you become a fully licensed bank, you can directly connect into the payment schemes. So we became the 13th member of Faster Payments and we put an API around that access. We immediately had a whole host of different companies coming to us, banks and fintechs alike, asking if they could access those payment schemes through our APIs. So as you can imagine, Starling being a tech company with these APIs, it means all of a sudden, accessing those payment schemes for us, we could onboard within a matter of six to eight weeks and add a fraction of the cost of any of the competitors because our costs were so much lower. And so what that actually spawned off was now we have a payment services division. And so what that is, is it's just real-time access to faster payments and backs in these other payment schemes. So we have a number of strategic partners for that that help to enable that as well, which you can see at the bottom. These are more of API aggregators if you're familiar. So here's our first partners for, um, for those payment services. So as you can see, it ranges from banks, some of which are large and known, some of which like N26 are a bit newer and that you might be less familiar with other challenger banks, 
to fintechs and e-money institutions, corporate and government, Department of Work and Pensions was actually one of our first partners, um, to strategic partners like Vocalink from MasterCard. And then we get into the banking as a service offering. So then the next thing that we kept hearing from, from various businesses and customers was that they wanted to be able to integrate more from our APIs than just the classic retail API, which is read-only account data up through payments via the API. So what that looks like is we've actually created another set of APIs, which can be all the way from creating an account by the API. So now Raisin, which is a savings marketplace, which is new to the UK, in Raisin, you can actually open a bank account, but it's actually Starling. It's just our APIs being white labeled into the service. And what it's really looking at is how we're opening up our infrastructure and our tech to other companies in a way that wasn't previously done by banking, but by virtue of having these open APIs. And I think what's quite interesting about this is whenever you build out this type of open platform, is that there's a lot more use cases than you might initially predict for how people will want to use and build on these particular APIs. And so with that, I'll leave it here, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. I have a question around um, verification of partners that you work with. Do you, go, do you do any due diligence? How, about, how, how does that come about? So depending on the partner, we have a number of different types of due diligence. So when we set up the developer platform, it was very much with this idea that the APIs are only so useful as they are accessible, but then it's only so easy to set up as the due diligence is straightforward. So we have the due diligence based on a tier structure. We broke down the APIs from tier one, basic read-only APIs, all the way up to tier five, which is instructing payments via the API. And based off of which tier you want to access dictates the level of due diligence that we'll do. So the due diligence is we look at the terms of service and privacy policy, the data protection, information security. We look at the results of their pen tests. We make sure they're encrypting data at rest and in transit and all these types of things. Um, what's made that somewhat easier on the retail side is the open banking directory. So if a company is listed on that directory, we don't actually have to do the data protection, information security due diligence. We can just automatically give them access. Regardless, if they're in the marketplace in the app, we still do things like director's checks. Um, if they are a partner for banking as a service or payment services, there's a whole other set of due diligence we do. And we work with a third party consulting firm that will do the due diligence for them and then they just provide the results to us. Um, I've just got a question about the branding. When I'm listening to this, and, and I think clearly differentiation with more traditional legacy banks but a lot of these things you are hearing from lots of lots of startup banks how i can see the white label growth how do you differentiate when everybody's kind of looking almost the same even when they're different if you know what i mean so this is a great question because being a challenger bank right now is like being lonely in a crowded room because we only really have one competitor in the uk is a fully licensed bank which is monzo and so between us, we're actually quite similar. We have different strengths and trade-offs, but there, there's quite a bit of overlap. There's a lot of others like Revolut or Adam and Tandem that are in the same kind of area, but Adam only provides mortgages and savings. Tandem only provides credit and savings. And so they're actually a competitor in the space and have a similar tact, I would say, on branding and positioning as digital while offering very different services. They would be someone that we would partner with rather than compete with, I would say, right now. Um, the way that we currently differentiate is in a number of ways. So on the one hand, um, the services we offer. So for example, we're the only one who's offering from retail current accounts, joint accounts, and SME accounts. Doing things like post office deposits, we're the only first digital bank to do that. Um, one of the notable things, which I actually didn't predict as being quite so um, persuasive to begin with is the fact that we don't have any fees. So we don't have any fees um, in the UK or abroad. We have no international fees. We have no ATM fees. We have no unauthorized overdraft fees. Um, everyone else in the space has at least put limits on it. So you have no fees up until a certain amount. Um, or if you have so much usage, then there's no fees. And so for us, it's made us quite provocative. Um, I would say for those who, who that financial Um, so far, yes, definitely. The thing that we found is, so we do quite a bit of marketing in terms of like SEO and digital. And so our customer 
acquisition cost is about 12 pounds. But by far the biggest driver of customer acquisition is actually word of mouth growth. So someone opens the Starling account, they have a great experience and they tell their friends and family. The other part about it is that it works really well between people who have Starling bank accounts. So for example, if we were both on Starling, we go out to dinner and we when to split the bill, we use this like Google nearby tech. So we'd literally just set our phones next to each other. We tap the transaction and automatically split it between us. And so things like that that make it really easy have this kind of viral effect that we've noticed between users. The other interesting thing though actually is because we're really good for traveling and we were, do you guys know that Martin Lewis, I think it's called Smart Money People Show? So we were, we were recommended as the best uh, travel card, the best bank is a travel card, and it has this massive uplift within that segment, and particularly actually people in the 70 plus range, I think who travel quite a bit and go on cruises and things like that. So it's this interesting where we're typically 18 to 35 year olds, but then we also have these kind of odd other segments for people who that's really relevant for that want to use it for that purpose as well. Hi, Megan, thanks for sharing that. Um, just interested around the marketplace. So you obviously offer customers great choice in terms of these other providers. How do you kind of balance, I suppose, the quality of those providers, but also how do you kind of protect yourselves, I suppose, from a customer that might take out, say, account or Wealthify, lose a bit of money down the line, they might gain some money, but how do you kind of differentiate and protect yourselves in terms of, yes, I've invested in wealth, but I've lost money, that's that's not Starling that I'm angry at, but also just the quality of the services that all of those providers give you. Yeah, so in our early days, we're being quite curated about it. So while we have the due diligence side, the other side of it is very much looking for companies that fit with our brand and also the technology. So we very much assume that even though we have this shared customer relationship, you start in Starling, but then you leave and go into the Wealthify app, you have a separate relationship, customer support queries are separate and everything, that if that company was to fail, that would still reflect negatively on Starling. And so despite the fact that from a technology perspective, we're very scalable and we can have any number of partners join, we're quite conscious that in the first 12 to 18 months that we want to keep it quite curated for that purpose to make sure we're only introducing our customers to partners that we'd be proud to introduce. That being said, there's two additional points that we're really looking at maintaining as we scale. So we want to keep um, a level of quality, which is in part helped by the fact that there's the open banking directory who do a certain amount of due diligence to say who can or cannot access banking APIs. Um, but we want to keep the user experience um, quite high quality. So right now we only have a few partners per category, so the, you're not overwhelmed by choice. But when we meet this goal of having um, anyone being able to plug in, should they meet the due diligence requirements or be on the open banking directory, all of a sudden customers could be overwhelmed by 20 to 30 options and have no idea how to make sense of that. So the next thing we're really focusing on is, okay, what customer data do we have to help customers make better financial decisions and what does that look like? Being able to provide insights and help in accessing those products. And so I think there's this whole conversation of, okay, it's curated right now, we have a certain um, ownership over what this experience can look like, but we want it to be open. How do we make sure it's safe and secure as we open it, but also high quality experience? Um, I think ongoing though, these types of integrations with third parties is going to become increasingly common. So open banking technically launched 13th of January of this year, but it's being rolled out through September 2019. But the whole premise is that the CMA9 have to manifest APIs to enable customers to access third party products. And I think this type of relationship where your bank might um, have your data, but will enable you to connect to third parties will become increasingly common. And if there's a query around, oh, I've lost money with this third party, how is that handled? Um, those answers will become a bit more easy to solve. Right now, I think purely in the external integration way, there's already a framework created by the open banking directory where at first the bank takes the, the fault and will make it right with you if you just lose money in the transaction, not necessarily with an investment. Um, but then there's a dispute resolution model to solve it as well. Have you had any integrations where like, you've had to work with the regulators to convince them that this was gonna happen or that, that kind of example? Um, so actually, to enable anything with a marketplace, so we, gosh, back in like December, November, December 2016, I started putting together the regulatory plan to submit our application for the marketplace, and I'd really hoped it would take like 
I don't know, 60 to 90 days to get permission to launch this thing. It took about seven months. So I ha we had so many meetings in person and remotely where we had to walk them through exactly how they would integrate, how we would tell customers about fees, what the whole thing would look like. And to be fair, no bank has this particular set of permissions to integrate partners in this way. So I appreciate that they eventually gave us permission, even though it took a long time. Um, but what we had to do was walk them through how it would work with financial and non-financial partners. So if you recall, if you've been kind of watching this journey, we actually launched first with someone called Flux, who does loyalty and receipts. So you don't have to have a loyalty card. You can just automatically get loyalty as you pay on your card. Um, but we did that because they were a non-financial partner, and we really wanted to start building it. And so we did that actually before we had the regulatory permission. Um, but most of the other ones, because we can work with non-regulated partners, so we have our own due diligence process to enable that, should we choose to do so. And the part that we just have to consider there is our risk. So we've outlined a risk appetite um, for which kind of partners we're willing to work with. And each time we kind of assess the risks for each on kind of a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you.